Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Thurban. I'm with the National Office of the Nonprofit Leadership Alliance. We're glad you could join us today. We have Dr. Nathan Schamleffel here to talk to us about online service learning engagement. And since the majority of you online are probably familiar with the Alliance, I'll just go ahead and let Dr. Schamleffel get started. So Dr. Schamleffel, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and project my screen here. Hopefully you're, uh, you're seeing my PowerPoint slide at this time. Yes, it looks great. And um, everyone, if you have questions during the presentation, you can either use the chat function, the question function, or um, use the raise your hand function, and I can um, unmute you to let you ask Dr. Shamlafel your question personally. So with that, yeah, I'll let you get started. Good, thanks. Kate, has my webcam projected for you? Yes, we can see you clearly. All right, all right. Well, sorry for the distraction on the back wall. Every time my wife and I move, she moves stuff to the garage sale pile, and I rescue it and hang it on my wall at work. So I apologize for the, the distraction. Uh, I hope you're doing well today. I know it's uh, kind of a mess here in Indiana, weather-wise, and uh, so um, I'm uh, anxiously awaiting spring like most of you. Uh, we're here today to talk about online community engagement and service learning. Uh, there's some different terms out there we'll use, but we're going to just focus on using using the the term I think most of us are familiar most familiar with and most comfortable with, which is service learning. So uh, with that, um, I have a couple roles. Um, my my role here academically is I'm an associate professor at Indiana State University, and I'm also the campus executive director of our nonprofit leadership law and certification program, which is a minor and a major right now in its cur current iteration. Uh, at Indiana State. Uh, much of the work that I'm going to share with you uh, today related to um, e-service learning uh, is from my time as a faculty fellow and senior faculty fellow for Indiana Campus Compact. And much of what I'm going to share today uh, is recorded in this uh, book, an e-book, uh, that, that I wrote most of with some colleagues through Indiana Campus Compact uh, that's available on Amazon. It is kind of written as a blog, it's an easy read, and it's intended for those that lead and manage nonprofits who are uh, in need of resources and want to create a strategic partnership with academic types like us uh, that are mutually beneficial. So beneficial in terms of uh, meeting strategic goals and objectives for the organization, meeting uh, the learning outcomes for students, and meeting the professional development needs for faculty. So it's a book based on win-win-win strategic partnerships. I'm also proprietor and senior consultant at Driven Strategic LLC. I encourage you to visit uh, my website at drivenstrategic.com. Uh, I do do uh, consulting for university engagement, um, whether it's service learning and community engagement and online community engagement uh, consulting or helping you uh, apply nonprofit leadership and management uh, principles and competencies to the development of university-based centers um, or community outreach from an academic department. So uh, today's focus will be to really think about how do we understand and overcome barriers to online service learning and how do we assess community engagement and service learning in the online environment. Uh, finally, we'll try to, uh, I guess, uh, strategize a bit about how to, uh, how to build service learning as a critical component and as a kind of opt pedagogy in your online programming. Um, specifically, I hope today that you'll be able to leave this webinar identifying barriers to including community engagement and service learning in the online environment. I hope you'll better understand authentic assessment and be able to define that and understand its synergy with a community engagement and service learning pedagogy. And I hope you'll get a chance to evaluate two analytical grading rubrics uh, that I'll provide related to two different online assignments related to community engagement and service learning. So for starters, these are some of my conclusions. I decided to offer them first uh, today instead of saving them uh, for the end. So let me, let me go through some real basic things that I hope make sense. And um, these are, uh, I think, things that if you can wrap your head around, uh, you might be more agreeable to trying some of these online community engagement and service and, uh, activities with your courses. Um, what, what I found from my academic assessment data since spring 14 um, it's pretty simple. Students who do the work and turn it in on time tend to do pretty well in the course. Uh, the other thing that I've came to come to the conclusion of is that community engagement and service learning as a pedagogy is effective for progressing towards and achieving learning outcomes, whether that's on campus, hybrid, or online courses. 
I've come to the conclusion that the online environment is an effective environment for progressing toward and achieving learning outcomes with or without community engagement and service learning. And finally, tie all those things together. And uh, if you have students that are willing to do the work and engage in an online course, uh, it is possible to achieve learning outcomes using a community engagement and service learning pedagogy in an online environment. And so hopefully today you'll start with the fact that it is possible. It's a lot of work. It might take a lot of redesign of your courses, but it is possible if for whatever reason um, many of your courses are moving online. Um, whether, whether you want them to or not, whether it's a need for uh, new enrollment or faculty teaching load issues or whatever it might be in your institution, um, if you either want or have to take your uh, courses online where you've uh, traditionally done community engagement and service learning, you don't have to leave that behind. And uh, that's some of the good news for today. So uh, I was on sabbatical in spring 2014 and I, for a variety of reasons, was in, in need of, I was growing our minor and major in our graduate offerings and nonprofit leadership. And uh, with teaching load issues and with our academic year and needing to use summers, uh, I really felt the need to create a number of offerings that were totally online courses. Um, and so I created a number of nonprofit leadership courses that were, for the most part, I would say 98% asynchronous courses. Uh, those online asynchronous courses, as I designed them, were also designed as OER courses. OER courses are what uh, many of you know as open educational resource courses, which basically means that there's no required textbooks and that there are no required course fees or other course materials that a student would have to purchase beyond the regular tuition and fees to be a student on campus. Um, that's a, an initiative in our university strategic plan is to lower the cost of education at our institution. And our university is actually, actually has a, a really nice program to entice faculty to convert their courses to the OER format. It was perfect timing for me. I was developing the courses totally asynchronous. I use a ton of blogs um, from, from consultants. I use uh, websites from professional associations. I use YouTube videos from speakers I've seen at conferences. Uh, there are so many open source materials out there um, that can give the content uh, for a course. The other thing I really like about using the OER format is that it allows us to flip our classroom. Uh, whether you're using an on-campus format or a hybrid course format or an online course, you can actually flip the classroom a little bit easier um, by putting all the materials online. It allows you to bring in more guest speakers and other people other than yourself and a textbook author into your course. So the courses I've designed and assessed are totally asynchronous for the most part, and they're also open educational resource courses. Community engagement and service learning is a, a, a big issue at Indiana State. About 12 or 13 years ago, a university president came in and put a focus on community engagement and service learning, and that has been our rallying cry that separates us here in Indiana, uh, separate from the other universities, uh, that we try to attract students of all achievement levels from the highest performing high school students to, to uh, students that, that might need remediation. Um, but we really uh, bring students in here that they're going to get opportunities to engage in the campus and the community. Um, so, so the support in our campus culture uh, at this time was very supportive of not only taking courses online, making them an OER format, but also uh, heavily integrating community engagement and service learning. The other initiative that we have here at Indiana State University is Sensor. Some of you are aware, aware of Sensor. Uh, Sensor uh, is an organization called Science Education for New Civic Engagements and Responsibilities. You can go to sensor.net and learn about them, but I'm going to show you some assessment data today that comes from Sensor's website. It's a really great way to assess courses. Whether you're a Sensor camp or campus or not, you can use a lot of resources on the Sensor website uh, for, for academic assessment related to community engagement and service learning for your on-campus, your hybrid, and your online courses. There were a lot of things swirling around here that I was really trying to tie together uh, to create what I would consider optimal course design for the students in our nonprofit leadership uh, curriculum. So with that, I'd like to chat just a little bit about barriers to community engagement and service learning. Uh, whether it's on-campus, hybrid, or distance courses, I think all of us know 
uh, that there are barriers to implementing a pedagogy that's heavy on community engagement and service learning. And I would love for you to either to type into the chat box so that Kate can see those uh, and moderate that discussion or actually unmute you and allow you to contribute to the conversation today. So I hope that you might consider raising your hand electronically and sharing what are some barriers to community engagement and service learning from your experiences. And then as that information comes in, we'll let, we'll let Kate pull that together and moderate that here for a minute. Okay, um, someone asked about students' time constraints. Um, that's a good one. Time, that, yeah, a lot of, so a lot of it, um, have three questions kind of about the amount of time that it's gonna take students to, to complete these. Good. Okay, so time is definitely a barrier for for the students and for faculty. Good. Anything else coming up in the in the chat box, sir? Um, yeah, I'll let um, Judith. I'll let you go ahead and ask. Okay. Can you hear me? We sure can. Go ahead. Great. Yeah, I think in my experience, uh, part of the issue has been coordination. Uh, I know that some campuses have an office that helps coordinate service learning, and then some departments are on their own to do it. So just finding the partners. I think is, is a specific part of that time commitment that seems to be challenging. Absolutely. Agree with that 100%. Any other, any other things other than coordination and time? Um, another, Angela Widner says um, the difference in students' experience when working with various organizations um, or groups. Yeah, I, I, I've experienced that too. Um, and depending on the course, what projects are appropriate, um, whether they're all majors in a 400 level course or whether it's an introductory course in the general education or foundational studies program, uh, can be a real can be a real difference in terms of what the learning outcomes are for the course. So to address, the, oh, go, go ahead, okay. go ahead. Yeah, just the last one that I see is um, how it fits into tenure and promotion. I've had those experiences myself. <laughs> so, so I'll briefly talk about, I, I was a, in a group of faculty fellows with Indiana Campus Compact, and we did an Indiana-based study of community engagement and service learning um, in, in the promotion and tenure env uh, environment. And unfortunately, um, our, our conclusions or what we hypoth hypothesized, which was that um, community engagement and service learning is a, a, a time killer um, and one that if you're not careful can cost you promotion and tenure um, because you're not writing enough and you're spending too much time on, on service and class prep. Um, our, our findings were overwhelming um, that even on progressive campuses that have nonprofit leadership programs that are uh, community engaged campuses with the Carnegie ratings like Indiana State uh, is, um, that even at the most progressive community engagement campuses, the promotion and tenure process uh, has not realigned with the strategic plans of the organization. So you have a board and a president and vice presidents and deans saying do this, and then we have a promotion and tenure process saying do this, so we're spending our time here, but we're being evaluated with this. And so that led to us publishing that study in the Journal of Community Engagement in Higher Education, and we actually titled it, Serve at Your Own Risk. So there is a risk to your own uh, security if you overinvest in community engagement and service learning. And so hopefully some of the things we'll talk about at the end here is how can you get more mileage for the time that you spend, and how can you create mutually beneficial partnerships, not just partnerships that are just good for the student and good for the agency, but partnerships that are good for the student the, the partner organization, as well as the professional development goals of the faculty member, whether that's a title or a reference letter or an opportunity to collect uh, assessment data and, and uh, program evaluation data, whatever that might be, um, to write, write with. And so I strongly suggest um, that whatever project we do to eliminate some of these barriers, that we have a strong MOU, a memorandum of understanding that outlines what the needs are for each stakeholder and to not be afraid, to not be shy, to write in that you need uh, access to data and that you have intellectual property needs and that you need to be able to do PR on your work and that you need to be able to collect data that will allow you to publish scholarship of application and engagement type work and present on those things as well as publish a scholarship of teaching and learning 
uh, type work in terms of public publications and presentations so that your community engagement and service learning generates what you need for scholarship and for teaching and for service. And so hopefully some of the things I'll offer today addresses those needs for uh, pre-tenure uh, faculty. Uh, also, even post-tenure, I'm at a campus that requires post-tenure review, and even still, every two years I'm evaluated, and I need to be careful about my time and make sure I'm getting uh, the things that I need for the, the traditional three-legged stool to make my work look like other, make it look like a, uh, make it look like the piles that others that don't do community engagement, service learning expect our piles to look in terms of scholarship, teaching, and service. So those are definitely some some barriers. Um, to community engagement and service learning. Uh, probably the one most germane to online community engagement is geographic proximity and how do we use technology to close that gap and I'm going to offer some strategies for that too today. Before we move on, um, I would like to chat a little bit about authentic assessment. I'm curious if anybody's familiar with the term authentic assessment or in general what folks that are on this webinar, what their understanding is of authentic assessment in terms of academic assessment. You can go ahead and raise your hand or, or chat in to, uh, to Kate there and she'll be able to moderate again for us. Not seeing any responses. Does that mean nobody's familiar? That's okay. I can share. Going once, twice, three times, sold. So something that we have to consider, and I think um, most of you on the call are, are a part of the alliance and with our learning outcomes rubric, is that we're in a competency-based education program and there's the expectation that we assess the learning in our courses that count for the CNP for our students and that we're beginning to report that data back to the alliance nationally at least on my campus, we have to, to also report at a campus level to a software system called TaskStream. So the nice thing about using a learning management system like Blackboard or like Moodle to capture assessment data is that we can pull that assessment data out of our learning management system that we use to deliver our online courses and to upload that into TaskStream for my campus and to upload that into the, uh, the new system with curricular mapping that the Nonprofit Leadership Alliance is using. So authentic assessment, and, and this is my understanding, this is how I've wrapped my head around it, is that, is that the higher you get on Bloom's taxonomy in terms of, of academic project design. So if you're um, at the creation or evaluation level, you're offering a more authentic assessment tool. So one of the projects I'm going to talk about today is a project where I have an online fundraising course, Fundamentals and Nonprofit Fundraising, and the students have to write a case statement. And they actually partner, they select a nonprofit partner. So if I have 12 students, I have 12 different nonprofit partners. And they actually create a fir what I would consider a really good first draft of a comprehensive fundraising case statement in partnership with the executive director and or board president of that organization. And then I use an analytical grading rubric to assess the quality of the work of the student. So uh, that assignment is, is designed at the creation level where they're producing new or original work. When the assignment is designed for a student to create or to evaluate something, that's more authentic than an assignment that is designed for the student to remember or understand. And the goal of authentic academic assessment is to move higher on Bloom's taxonomy. Now the interesting thing is about nonprofit leadership education is that we've been doing community engagement and service learning since long before it was in vogue and before it was cool. And that's a good thing or a strength of interdisciplinary nonprofit leadership education programs is we've always been community uh, based. Uh, we've always had a strong service learning component to how our classes work and the benefit of this trend in academic assessment is actually to our advantage. And the things that we're doing at higher levels of bloom is actually more authentic academic assessment. So there's really three uh, worlds colliding um, that I think makes it right for people like us um, to take advantage of these three worlds colliding um, to uh, further or to even just start e-service learning. The first world that's colliding is a strong 
uh, increase in online programs at the undergraduate and graduate levels and a disproportionately high, increasingly high online enrollments. That's world one. Enrollment and programming for online collegiate credit courses has gone up tremendously. The second thing that we're seeing across all types of colleges and universities, from the smallest private liberal arts schools, religiously affiliated schools, to community colleges, to state college and universities, all the way through research intensive universities, as we've seen a, an increase, significant increase in community engagement and service learning and putting a focus back on civic, uh, civic responsibility and citizenship of all college graduates. The last world that's really colliding with these two is the need uh, to show impact in learning and to document learning outcomes through academic assessment. We're seeing that at the campus level uh, with regional accreditation and we're also seeing it with professional association accreditation and we're also seeing it uh, with curricular mapping with the Nonprofit Leadership Alliance. Um, so those are probably three things. I hope you're all nodding your head and, and agreeable to the fact that, that these three positive things are colliding. Online enrollment, increased community engagement and service learning and an increase in need for academic assessment, which really is a perfect storm to redesign online courses so that they have authentic assessment, so that they're open educational resource and that they're asynchronous. Um, so good things are happening here to jump on these opportunities. So with that, I'm going to share just a little bit of literature. I'm not the first person to do e-service learning, but there's not too many people doing e-service learning, and there's especially not all that many people writing about e-service learning. Some of the best and earliest work I can find is just from a few years ago by Waldner, McGorry, and Widner, with really caution that service learning that 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 they caution that service learning risks being left behind as instructors increasingly transition to online learning platforms. And that was a real concern just five years ago. And it's, I guess, still a concern that when a person who's traditionally used community engagement and service learning as a pedagogy has to teach online, they think they have to give that up. And, and the short of it is they don't. They don't have to give that up if they want to use technology to continue that. So the good news is if you're moving online, uh, don't be afraid um, and, and don't be upset. You can take your community engagement and service learning pedagogy with you to the online environment. Um, the good news is, is that e-service learning has been proven to actually enhance engagement, student engagement in online courses, and it facilitates, online learning facilitates service learning as opposed, uh, opposed to blocking. Uh, uh, E-service learning can free service learning from geographical constraints, which is nice. Most of us that do service learning tend to do it during the fall and spring semesters in our immediate campus communities. The nice thing is, is that we can serve communities anywhere in the world with well-designed uh, service learning projects. Um, so finally, where I'm at for the rest of the seminar is to talk a little bit about two types of online service learning. The first one is e-service learning, and the second one is extreme e-service learning. So I'm going to call these ESL for e-service learning and XESL for extreme e-service learning. Extreme e-service learning is 100% service and 100% instruction, 100% online. That's extreme e-service learning. E-service learning is a combination of some of the instruction and some of the service being some in the community and some online at different percentages. So it can be e-service learning could be 100% instruction online and 100% service in the community, or the instruction could be 50% online, 50% in the community, and the service could be 50-50. E-service learning can be whatever combination you can dream up of instruction and service, some being online and some, some being in the community. Extreme e-service learning, again, is 100% instruction, 100% service, 100% online. So before I move forward, I'd like to pause and uh, take a few questions if anybody has them. Uh, I can clarify terms, I can slow down, I can back up. Please, uh, please let me know how I can, can help. If you can chat in or raise your hand and we'll let Kate moderate any concerns. Uh, one question we did have from earlier, uh, Dr. Shamuffel, was um, depending on your reach or scope, it can be difficult to pick a community when online. So their question was, you know, if you have students in Michigan and then on the other side in Virginia, um, how, do you, how do you get them to connect and to match? Uh, the students or the communities or both? I think they mean students. Okay. Well, let me, that's a good question. And I, 
I think the examples I'm going to share here will clarify that. So whoever asked that question, if you can hang on to that and let me come back to it at the end, I, I think I might illustrate some different ways to do that uh, here in just a moment. And if I don't hit the nail on the head with you, make sure I answer it before we're done for the day. Any Great. Anyone else? Nothing else is coming in right now. Okay. So what I want to share is just a little bit of a case study from fundraising education. I'm going to share some academic assessment data that I collected in 2014 with some five-week online uh, courses. Um, I'm not going to read every slide to you. I, I've provided some information there, but I, I'm just going to hit the highlights from slide to slide. Um, there was an NS16 with this five-week course, undergraduate students, and it was a nonprofit fundraising course. It started with fundraising ethics. It went into annual funds, comprehensive uh, campaigns, major gifts, and plan giving. We stayed away from grants um, and grant proposals but because I wanted to focus on those other things. Just to give you an idea of the content of the course, um, this, this model is a, a model I'm writing a book on right now. And it, it's basically a metaphor that strong and healthy nonprofits uh, operate like strong and healthy oak trees, and the roots of all uh, healthy organizations um, are a mission and a strong uh, board of directors. Uh, you'll see on the right side of the tree over there are boxes four, five, and six, and that's really where the financial resource development function of this model fits in. And so the course, I start every class I teach with this tree model, and then I connect the learning outcomes for the specific course to where that helps them learn how to run a healthy nonprofit organization. And so it really functions here in creating case statements and creating case expressions. Um, what in this case uh, for a class project would be a direct mail letter uh, that we did online and then uh, finalize the relationship building process. Data, data for the academic assessment uh, here came from uh, analytical grading rubrics on Blackboard. We are a Blackboard campus. I understand some of you may be using Moodle and some other software systems. Uh, most systems will allow you to do what I do with Blackboard. I also used a, a sensor baseline and a sensor SOLG. The SOLG is the student assessment for learning goals. Basically, the baseline is the pretest, and the SOLG is the post-test. Uh, I'll show some heat tables from that. I also did some Blackboard reflective journals, some early formative course evaluation, and some end of course evaluation. And then I triangulated that data around each of the learning outcomes for the project. So the first project I want to highlight here is the ESL, the e-service learning case statement. For those of you that aren't familiar with fundraising, all fundraising starts with a case statement. Uh, it's basically a five to ten page document about why your organization is so awesome and why a donor or a grant maker should give resources and, and money to your organization. It's a document that you never let outside your organization. It's only for your senior staff and board of directors and key, key fundraising volunteers. But everything comes from that, whether it's a tweet or a phone solicitation script or a direct mail letter or a direct email or a special event, whatever it is, the content for those, for those marketing tools or what we call case expressions come from the case statement. And I know not everybody on this call is a fundraiser, so I want you to understand the project a little bit. A case statement is kind of like an armory. It's a place where you keep all your weapons and you never really show it to anybody. And then you use specific marketing tools. So you might take out of a 10-page case statement one, one sentence of 140 characters and tweet that out for crowdfunding. So it's just a place to keep all the stuff, all your success, organized so that it can be used for fundraising. Um, with that, this ESL assignment was an asynchronous individual project, uh, and to help answer the question from the person earlier, this is an individual project where individuals got to select their own nonprofit organization. I suggested that it would be geographically proximate to that student. So if that student was in Michigan or Virginia, I encouraged them to pick an organization in their community that they could drive to and meet in person with the executive director. The next project I'm going to highlight um, is, is, is organized differently, and that's why I kind of put that, that question off. The learning outcome from the Alliance Learning Outcomes rubric was that students will demonstrate the ability to write an organizational case statement, and that's what we were trying to assess with this particular project. Something I used to close, uh, to close the geographic gap is I used Blackboard to our advantage. I've worked with our campus so I can get our community partners Blackboard username and passwords, which is absolutely critical to facilitating e-service learning. If you see here, 
I actually create a community partners button and I include a welcome video use integrity that's specifically tailored. So the students always start at the start here button. The community partners button is a, a start here button for the community partners. I have the students fill out a survey, give me the contact information of their partner. I email them a password and a username and a nice welcome message and a thank you and I encourage them to go to Blackboard and log in and click here and click there to get to this page and then they watch a welcome video from me much much like you're seeing here live. I also web link or, or an intralink to the case statement and case expression uh, OER material so that they can actually view and read and watch the YouTube videos and all the things that the students had to watch to prepare. I also provide a link to the excuse me, I provide a link to the assignment sheet and where the students are going to submit the assignment so that the community partners have all of the information that the students have. I also provide a variety of other resources on this page, but I find that creating this community partners page and engaging uh, the community partners in the virtual office hours uh, with, a, with a video, with connections to these resources helps tremendously in facilitating communication between myself, the community partner, and the student. Uh, with that, I do grade everything with uh, analytical grading rubrics, and this is, I know you can't see every detail here, um, but you'll see that ultimately students would want uh, to achieve the far right column here, and what that means is that the case statement should effectively document and communicate the case for support, as well as serve as the foundation for la launching case uh, expressions. So something I did with my online course design is I, I don't use a textbook anymore since it's an OER course, but I really like the chapter on how to create a case statement. So what I did is I cited the textbook that I used to require and I created a rubric to grade this assignment based on the tips given in the book that I used to use as a textbook. So it was a great way to pull in resources from the book and encourage students to buy that book anyways, just not require it. Um, and then I also uh, encourage my community partners to use that book too. And then I've structured my assessment, my authentic assessment, around this project and around the textbook. And that just gives an example of what a rubric would look like for an authentic academic assessment. Uh, what I found here um, from a grading standpoint is that students on this project uh, did okay. Um, not, not fantastic. We had four students do really well. Um, and then we had, you know, about half the class in the middle. Um, that's going to I have a reason for that. This was a five-week course, and uh, it's a pretty intense course, and students aren't all that well prepared. And so something that I think we all have to, to quit doing is making the assumption that just because they're a millennial that they understand technology. That's one of the, the biggest mistakes that I think faculty make today with our millennial college students is that they're technology savvy. Really, they can dink around in text and Snapchat, but other than that, they're really not that good at technology, and they're actually pretty darn afraid of it. Uh, in all our glory here at Indiana State, our faculty has decided to take technology out of our general education, and in all our glory in our major in recreation and sport management that I'm a part of, we've taken out the computer applications course. So a student can come out of high school, major in my major in recreation and sport management, and not take one class in technology. Um, I've made a commitment in our nonprofit leadership in minor and major to integrate technology uh, learning outcomes and learning uh, technology applications in every course. In a five-week course, uh, it took the students two and a half uh, to three weeks to really understand how Blackboard works and the technology I was using. So I really uh, had to fix that. And one way that I fixed that is I've uh, made all my fall and spring courses um, hybrid courses. And I designed my Blackboard courses for my fall and spring hybrid courses to look exactly like my summer online courses. And I've also integrated every type of assignment that I do in an online course uh, with wikis and blogs and journals. I've built those into my fall spring hybrid courses so that the students will be with me two semesters before they get to an online course and I've built their Blackboard capacity to be an online student to fix the issue that you're seeing with the grades uh, here. Uh, and I just found that there was just a real student preparedness issue for students to be online students and to effectively navigate a community engagement project using technology. This is a, a heat table that comes from the sensor, um, a baseline and SOLG. And basically what you want, if you're not used to reading heat table, in this case you want uh, most of your heat, the green areas, the dark green areas, 
to be in the bottom right. What you uh, really hope to see is that students really um, knew some stuff about the course learning outcomes and the project still caused them to have great gains. And so for the most part, when you look at this heat table, students will demonstrate the ability to write an organizational case statement. When we do a cross tab from pretest to post test, uh, for the most part, the class uh, had good and great gains from this community engagement and service learning project. So this gives evidence that online community engagement can move students uh, from point A to point B being closer to the learning outcomes. And you'll see that that data is consistent. When you look at the ESL case statement results here, this is also from the sensor baseline and saw, and you look to the second to last line, uh, how much did each of the following aspects of the class help you related to the ESL case statement assignment? Um, on, on a scale of five, the mean average was a 4.3. So that's uh, strong evidence that, that the uh, project was an effective way to use e-service learning to move online students to the course outcomes. And you'll see that that's um, pretty consistent. I'm just uh, managing time and taking a quick look at my watch here to make sure I don't get too far behind, and I, I hope you're finding some of this useful. Um, from the sensor SOLG, which is the uh, post-test, the student assessment of learning goals, it's a self-assessment. Uh, some interesting things that came from this is that students love the case statement assignment and it helped them learn about organizations and its needs related to fundraising and they learned how to properly write a case statement and that's really what nonprofit leadership education is about is it's about creating those professional competencies and using authentic assessment at high, high levels of Bloom's taxonomy where students are evaluating, they're applying, they're evaluating, they're creating, they're producing projects that are, are like the things that they're going to do in entry level jobs and online community engagement uh, can do that for the students. You'll see the second two quotes there are some things they want more of. Uh, they wanted more informational um, uh, instructions which I found interesting because the assignment sheet was about three pages long. Um, I'm not sure I could give any more but what I did conclude is that with it being an online course um, I, I probably could have created a video a recorded video explaining the written directions and that would have probably closed that gap. So not that they needed more instructions, but they could have probably had those inst the same instructions offered through video. And I'm starting to do that to uh, help uh, further the understanding of what I want uh, for the assignments. And so something I took to heart and I've tried to make some adjustments in my online courses. Uh, another student really just highlighted that writing the case statement and really it helped them understand the need for a case statement. So here's a student who actually had already interned at the Salvation Army and then they took this online course and did their fundraising case statement at the site and they learned a tremendous amount from e-service learning about an organization where they had spent over 300 hours that they felt they had learned tremendously new information and got better acquainted with the organization from the e-service learning project. Another student uh, reflected that they learned the value of a case statement, what makes it distinctive, and learn that a case statement needs to be both rational and emotional. I really look at that quote, and it's just really deep reflection, good qualitative uh, deep reflection about what an online service learning project can do to further student learning to the learning outcomes. So with that, um, that that's kind of the first case statement is an ESL a case statement assignment where students pick their own partner that they're geographically proximate to. The next project is XESL, Extreme Service Learning, and this is where I pick the partner and all students worked on one project with, with a nonprofit organization that I selected. Now that nonprofit organization is Catholic Charity St. Anne's Clinic. It's a free health and medical clinic just a few blocks from my building here uh, in a low-income part of Terre Haute, Indiana and um, the students were all over the country and they were online and so 100% instruction, 100% service, 100% online. They never stepped foot in the organization, they never met face to face and I was able to mediate that relationship by working with the nonprofit uh, executives in that particular organization. So here's how this one looked a little bit different. Um, it was asynchronous group project and we used wiki technology. Uh, the two most well-known wikis are Google Docs, that's a wiki, and Wikipedia is a wiki. It basically is a cloud-based forum for multiple people that have permission to go in and to add and delete and to alter content of a document or project. Um, Blackboard has a wiki function 
it's not quite as good as Google Docs in terms of functionality. Only one student can be in each, each wiki at a time uh, making changes, but it does record uh, how many letters, characters, words um, a student contributes. So when you're doing group projects in online courses or even hybrid or on campus courses, the wiki is a nice function um, because you can see what students are uh, uh, really leading their group and which ones are really just hoping to get a good grade because the rest of the group did the work. And the nice thing is I'm able to use a wiki and look at that assessment tool and I'm able to build in individual contribution to the group project as a part of the analytical grading rubric because of using the wiki that, that's embedded in Blackboard. So this is a, a XESL project. Um, the community partner is proximate to my campus. I can actually walk in their building. My students are distributed nationally. Uh, everything's done online in this particular project. And what we used was wiki technology to write a direct mail fundraising letter. So I think most of you um, probably get mail every day, especially towards the end of, an, of, a, of a fiscal calendar year for end of the year appeals. And you get, you know, I've got more return address labels than I could ever possibly use because I get them from St. Jude's and the National Park Foundation and the National Parks Conservation Association and the Wilderness Society. And every day I get get uh, direct mail letters in my mailbox uh, at home asking me to give uh, to give uh, on a regular basis. So we wanted to write a direct mail letter that this uh, Catholic Charities uh, Free Health and Medical Clinic could use to send out to supplement uh, their services. And there are three learning outcomes that this, this project was designed to, uh, designed to address to adapt personal and organizational messaging to help students define traditional fundraising methods, which direct mail is definitely a traditional fundraising method, and to define the role of development as a strategic function in an overall nonprofit organization. Again, another rubric based on the formerly required textbook. Uh, you'll see cited in the description there, and you'll see that the ultimate here, the highest grade, should be letters that should effectively motivate donors and prospects to give, repeat, or increase gifts. And so students are hoping uh, to the points in this column uh, throughout the particular rubric. Uh, you'll see here grades were much better. This was the second project in the class and the students, I, I chalked part of that up to, uh, they got better with the technology over the five week uh, period, got more comfortable with the technology. And you'll see uh, 90 to 100, nine of the 16 students scored at a 90 or 100 and another four uh, were at a C or higher. Um, so that's good news. Uh, the students that failed, the three that failed, had, a, had um, uh, basically quit, quit taking the class. They just didn't drop um, because be, for whatever reason, they, they, to them they weren't in the course, but they never dropped. So they're factored in there. So in this case, everybody that was actually in the class um, passed, passed with a C level or higher, uh, and the vast majority were an A level, uh, which, is, which is good news. I think the students learn in their capacity uh, was built. From a heat table standpoint using the sensor cross tabs, uh, you'll see for the first learning outcome about organizational messaging strategies, good news, there were good and great gains that students had from pre-test to post-test, again giving evidence that online community engagement and service learning, whether it be ESL or XESL, extreme service learning, uh, can move students towards the learning outcomes if done well. Uh, the second outcome related to defining traditional fundraising uh, methods. Um, again, uh, good strong data there related to good and great gains from pre-test to post-test. And also again with the third learning outcome, um, better understanding the role of development as a strategic function in the organization. I, I, as an instructor, really, really happy with the data there uh, with a five-week online course. I think that's significant considering the course was an intense five-week course. Also, you'll see here with the summative data, the very last line, the XEL, Sensor Annual Fund Direct Mail Letter Using Wiki, um, you'll see again the mean average was a 4.3 um, and 82% uh, came in that the, that the class project, the online XESL direct mail letter project using a wiki was much help or great help in getting uh, students to learn um, related to the particular learning outcomes. And so I think again, uh, strong evidence that e-service learning and extreme e-service learning is an appropriate and effective pedagogy for online course design. Um, I enjoy these quotes and uh, related to the XEL sensor uh, project, um, they said actually creating the documents really helped their understanding. 
And so remember, creation or production is the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy. It's the most authentic way to assess students. And here students are telling us without being prompted that creation or production, the highest level, level of Bloom, uh, really helped um, under, help their understanding and their learning. Uh, students said, I've gained the skills to write a direct mail letter and a case statement and effectively write for fundraising. So it gives credence that designing around Bloom's taxonomy at the highest levels for authentic assessment are the most effective ways to design online community engagement service learning. Other students said it built their confidence and prepared them for their career and that the activities involve them and, and help them get more experience, which gives credence that online community engagement can enhance student engagement in the online environment. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, some of the end of course evaluations, some of you may be looking at this data and saying, well, that's not real strong data. Um, but what I, what I found uh, here with this is a number of students struggled with the blog function of the Blackboard site. Um, and the blog required students to post and then to respond, um, where students worked together. And the blog function discouraged uh, some students there. So that data is actually unrelated to the community engagement projects. And then finally, I think some of the summative data from the course evaluation is that 14 out of 16 students said that, that, that this course design, more than most courses, whether they're on campus, hybrid, or online courses, help them make progress towards achieving the learning outcomes for the course. And so for a course that was totally asynchronous and OER in the sensor format, doing community engagement and service learning as an ESL and XESL project, I think it's tremendous support that, that the online environment can move students to learning outcomes and the online environment that uses community engagement and service learning can be a very effective tool for, for uh, achieving learning outcomes. So the way I assess this at the, the instructor, uh, three of the four learning outcomes, remember the first project had one learning outcome, the second project had three. So I've put all four learning outcomes together. And uh, I, I, I have assessed my course that um, three of the four outcomes uh, were meets the performance measure and that the last one that were some progress made, uh, that was related to the case statement assignment, which was requiring students to do things technologically that they probably weren't prepared for. And I found that my fall, spring on campus and hybrid courses are the key to building capacity so that they can be effective in the online environment. So I know we're running out of time here and we want to get some questions. I think we have about 13 or 14 minutes left. I hope I haven't bored too many of you here. But I hope that you're saying, eh, it looks like a lot of work, but I think I want to give this a try. Just remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. Maybe many of you won't get the benefit of going on a sabbatical and redesigning your courses and putting everything else on life on pause for the most part like I was able to do. But you can start designing an assignment here and there um, to start converting your courses and to kind of try out uh, some of these uh, different uh, functions that I've integrated into my courses. So if you want to give it a try, the first thing I'm going to recommend to you in terms of nuts and bolts is you got to get some training. I think most of you uh, remember the days of finishing your PhD, probably never having a, cor having a course and how to be a college instructor. You get on your tenure track and then you're magically supposed to be an excellent instructor or an effective instructor. And uh, the same thing's happening with so many online programs and courses going uh, online now is that we just say, well, they've got a PhD or an EDD and they've been teaching for 15 years on our campus, so sure they can teach online. Of course, and um, really, really, you can't. Uh, you can't. You can't do it effectively unless you're just just really that good. Um, I've been teaching online since the late '90s, and I didn't realize what I didn't know until I took uh, some training, um, and I've earned a couple online certificates. This is the online teaching certificate, the Sloan Consortium. Uh, the Sloan Consortium rebranded. They're now called the Online Learning Consortium. And they're an internationally renowned organization, and their mission is to train, to train online instructors for the collegiate environment. Um, I was able to get a grant through Indiana Campus Compact, a $3,000 grant to pay for my tuition. While I was on sabbatical, I took their intro course, which was 10 weeks, and I took my three electives. I took one on Twitter for learning and took one related to social media and some other things, and I earned my online instructor certificate. And I would strongly encourage you to find a way to come up with the money 
to go to the online learning consortium. I promise I have no affiliation with them. I'm getting no kickbacks. I just really believe that's the absolute best training that you can get to be an online instructor. Um, if you don't have the money to do that, some of your campuses um, have online instructor um, training through your faculty center for teaching excellence or your center for teaching and learning. And I also did this 10 week si course simultaneously while I was on sabbatical. So I, I did four courses through Online Learning Consortium and I did this as a fifth course and earned uh, two uh, credentials related to online instruction. And I just learned a tremendous um, amount. And I didn't think really I was all that ahead in my Blackboard or my, my online teaching skills. Um, but what I found is a lot of professors on my campus that have been here a long time didn't know how to post a PowerPoint on Blackboard. They didn't know how to use put in grades, much less use a wiki or an analytical grading rubric um, or to record a, a video for assignment instructions. So once I got in that course, I realized my technology skills were probably ahead of most uh, people. But um, from an online strategy, instructional design standpoint, I had a tremendous amount to learn, and I, I'm still I'm still learning a lot about it. Um, and I'd like to think I'm getting better. The other thing that I'm going to encourage you to do, get a better understanding of from a course instructional design uh, to, to the backward design uh, process. Uh, this is different than the flipped classroom. Some of you have, have heard of the term flipped classroom. Uh, the flipped classroom is basically where um, you put materials on your course website, like YouTube videos or recorded lectures and readings, and they do all that before they come to class, and then they come to class and work on projects at higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy so that the class time is project time and the lecture or content is done online before, um, as opposed to lecturing in class and then sending them out to do their projects after the point. That's, that's flipped classroom. That is different than backward design. Backward design is where you start with identifying your desired results. Where do you want to go? And what backward design is, is that it's in line with these trends in academic assessment for accreditation, regional and professional accreditation, uh, certification, um, uh, uh, curricular design, that sort of stuff. Um, we want to start with the outcome. When we designed this ESL and XESL project, I started with the learning outcomes first. What, what do the students need to learn? And then how am I going to assess that? And then what am I going to make the students do to get there? in terms of planning the learning experience and the instructional strategy, which I chose to use online e-service learning and online extreme e-service learning as my instructional tool to get the students to the results. And so if you haven't heard of backward design, I encourage you to poke around on Google and YouTube and other places. You'll see a citation there uh, for SlideShare uh, that I pulled for this visual. Um, but backward design is where it's at. And I think all of, our, all of us should be starting from that point, especially Alliance affiliated programs. We have our learning outcomes rubric. We have that now. We should be able to go back to every course and start with that rubric. That's backward design to start with our learning outcomes rubric and then replan the content of our courses based on that. Kind of like teaching to the test. We're designing, designing the course to the outcomes. Go figure. The other thing I would strongly recommend you to do is to start thinking about doing less projects. Um, that's something I'm doing. I used to do five or six community engagement projects for every class all the time, and I would say I was scratching the surface. And what I'm trying to do now is less projects, but I'm trying to do more with less. I'm trying to build thicker, richer, long-term relationships with a smaller number of community partners, and I'm putting those partnerships on paper through very thorough memorandum of understandings. And so just two resources that I've done is a colleague of mine from Indiana Campus Compact from University of Indianapolis and I, Jennifer Van Sickle, we published an article called Putting Your Partnerships on Paper. It's published in the Journal of Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance, which we affectionately call JOPERD. Uh, there's a similar chapter in the Cooperate book. So JOPERD, the JOPERD is a faculty perspective on how to do a community engagement MOU. The Cooperate book is kind of the same content, but it's geared towards a nonprofit professional and what their MOU would need to look like from their end. So there's two resources here on how to create a memorandum of understanding that's a win-win-win. It, it's a partnership that's designed to move our students towards learning outcomes. It's a partnership designed to move the nonprofit partner towards their strategic goals and objectives and mission so that they get good return on investment on the resources that they invest in a partnership with you 
and your students, and it has to be good for you for promotion and tenure in terms of the scholarship of application and engagement and the scholarship of teaching and learning, academic assessment data, uh, and nonprofit program evaluation data, stuff that you can um, uh, publish and stuff you can present and encouraging um, students to hopefully that they have a good experience uh, in your classes so that they'll rate you higher on teacher ratings, uh, instructional ratings, and also perhaps your community partner will nominate you for teaching awards and other things that can help with promotion, tenure, retention, and post-tenure review. So really got to get those things on paper to make sure they're win-win. I spent some time here on the community partners, but uh, getting your community and partners engaged with your online course manage your learning management system and providing them resources and closing that geographic uh, gap um, with technology is absolutely critical to successfully pulling off uh, e-service learning. So I'm going to conclude with a few key things here. Some things I've done and some mistakes I've made um, and things I'm trying to do better um, for my students is I'm trying to provide more detailed feedback beyond just the analytical grading rubrics and I'm starting to use SoundCloud um, where SoundCloud's the, a website where I can record audio feedback and I can embed a private link into their rubric and not only can they look at their rubric but they can hear me talk and give them feedback and I'm spending time on my bigger assignments, my more authentic assignments, I'm spending time with my totally distance ed courses to do that for my students. I'm also trying to provide more frequent and shorter instructor videos to tie together the OER resources. There's so much available for free in the public domain to, to convert your courses to open educational resource format, but for students that becomes a splatter of a YouTube video, an article, a blog, a website, they're not sure what they're supposed to get out of it, so I'm trying to create short three to five minute videos that'll say here's, here's ten things you're doing for this unit, here's what you're going to get out of it, here's what to look for, notice the trends, but to, I'm trying to create instructor-led videos that are the glue to glue the OER resources together for the students' learning uh, with, without providing all the content that I want students to have with online lectures. Um, I'm doing more in terms of uh, developing video presentations of the written assignment instructions, and I'm really trying to build capacity of students. I've alluded to that a few times, but in, in the assessment data that I showed today, um, uh, students overestimate their ability to complete two or three online courses in the summer, uh, as well as work 60 hours a week and their time management skills. Um, they, they don't visit me during virtual office hours that I have every day. Um, they don't do the live optional course orientation. Um, so students need to have their capacity built and they need to be set up to understand that online courses are not easier and that they need to get their technology skills up and that they need to set their personal life in a way where they can be successful online. And I'm spending a lot of time as an academic advisor and instructor doing that on campus before they get online. I've also spent some time saying that I adjust fall spring courses to my hybrid model and I've redesigned my on-campus and hybrid courses fall and spring so that they look just the same as my distance ed courses and that they get to try all those skills when they have me on campus so that they're ready for an online format. I'm also considering occasional mandatory synchronous sessions. That's something I've not done yet, but I plan to do next semester. I'm going to require the live course orientation, um, and I'll offer it a couple different times a day so all students can attend one of them. And I'm going to require um, a few class meetings where all students get live uh, on Blackboard Connect. So with that, I, I, I hope I didn't cover too much. I, I If you can understand my Southern Illinois twang, um, I hope you have some questions. I, you can always follow up with me too. Again, I do do university engagement consulting, whether it's helping you uh, professionally design your academic centers to function like nonprofits for community outreach or just instructional design related to community engagement, service learning on campus, hybrid, or uh, online. So. Um, I'm glad to take questions, and I hope you found a couple things valuable today. Thank you so much, Dr. Schumoffel. Um Yeah, I think we have time to squeeze in one or two questions. Um, one question we had was um, from Katharina Sprawl. She asked, as far as I understood, your courses were based on individual service learning. Are there any special recommendations about e-service learning in groups? Okay, so the case statement assignment was individual, but the direct mail wiki was in groups. So wiki is a group project. I probably wasn't clear enough about that, and I apologize. I had 16 students in that group, so I created four wikis, 
and I assigned the students to four different groups, and each group produced a direct mail letter. And then at the end of the semester, uh, I worked with the community partner and a couple students to take the best uh, nuggets from each of those four letters and pulled it together into one direct mail letter. But students did work in groups uh, using the wiki function in Blackboard. There were four groups on that extreme service learning project. Does, does that help or clarify, or can I clarify some more? Great. No, yeah, I think that that answered it. Um, and yes, she said thank you. Um, and I don't see any further questions from anyone. Um, so, Dr. Shamlaf, unless you have anything else to wrap it up, I think we can say goodbye. That, that'd be fine. If anybody would like to follow up by phone, um, you know, I'm available or by email. I'd be glad to to chat or schedule a separate Skype or whatever you would like to do. So, uh, just please please let me know how I can assist. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Shamalful, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. A recording of the presentation will be sent out to everyone shortly. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.